All right, so I guess we all have our coffee and tea or water at least. And yeah, so today it's my I'm really happy uh, to welcome uh, Ben Schau here from from Zurich, from Switzerland, from ETH to visit us. So I guess like many of us already <laughs> have really nice yeah. um, discussions and conversations. And I'm looking forward to the talk. Before that, let me just say like a few words. So Ben Chao studied um, physics in China in uh, Nanjing University. And, but then right after that, I uh, moved to the United States in 2011, right? Ten. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, To do her PhD at the University of, of, of Illinois um, to develop their experiments on um, to do quantum simulations, so called atoms, so with cold fermions, in optical lattices, so to simulate the Fermi Hubbard model. And maybe one of the highlights was the like, observation or demonstration of many body localization in the system. And many other things that we don't have the time to, to go through here now. But after that, um, around 2018, then when Xiao moved to, um, uh, to MIT um, to start like totally new experiments uh, on um, using Wittberg states, for example, to do nonlinear objects and quantum nonlinear objects. So something that is quite a few here are very much interested in in our center. But also to use these Woodberg states to um, in lattices again to like set up applications in quantum simulations again, but also in for, for quantum computing. And that has been super successful and is now like becoming like, a really big big field. So many other um, groups are, are following these approaches um, worldwide. And so the, and they were one of the first actually to establish that. So there was a spectacular success. And following this success, she now moved very recently uh, to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. ETH and the Paul Garrett School, as I, as I just learned, now to establish her own group and set up her own um, experimental program. And I look very much forward to the talk, and perhaps yeah. you also learn instruction and invitation. And this is actually my first time to be in Denmark, and I really enjoy the discussion I had yesterday and also today. So it is my great pleasure to talk about. Sorry, I'm just trying to. Yeah. Uh, quantum science with Friedberg atoms uh, from one to many. So uh, I started my tenure track assistant professor position at ETH from August 1st last year, and I also have a joint position at uh, PSI. So, okay, let's start. So I think maybe all of us here know how quantum science and quantum technology is attracting the interest not only from academic institute, but also from industry. So by harnessing the features of quantum mechanics, quantum device can outperform their classical version, like the application ranges from quantum sensing, quantum communication, then towards quantum simulation and quantum computation. And I will say maybe as one of the ultimate goal, ultimate goals, we would like to build up a general purpose quantum computer, which can be used to solve some practical problems that cannot be handled with the most even you know, powerful classical supercomputer. So to keep making progress along this direction, what our demand is to have large scale quantum systems, but also have the controllability at the single quantum level. There are many promising experiment platforms that can be used to implement quantum technologies. I list some of them here. I will say uh, each platform has its own advantages, but also face some challenges. So in my talk, what I will focus on is the experiment platforms based on neutral code atoms. And to be more specific, I will focus on the techniques based on neutral code atoms trapped in optic tracer arrays. So here is the outline of my talk. I think first for those of you who are not very familiar about how to use arrays of individually trapped atoms in optic tracers, I will give a brief introduction on this architecture and how we can use it for quantum computation and simulation. So in the second part of the talk, I will discuss a kind of alternative approach, which was developed when I was a postdoc at MIT and Harvard. And in the last part of my talk, I will outline 
what I plan to do for my own group at ATH and PI side. Okay, now let us start the story. And we know in principle, we can encode spins or qubits with any quantum objects which has more than two distinguishable quantum states. And for neutral code atoms, we can encode qubits and spins with two different electronic states of that atoms. And by applying some external electromagnetic fields, we can coherently manipulate the state of these electrons. Atom has our, atoms have one advantage, which is they are naturally identical. So that makes them relatively easier to scale the system size up. And today, okay, there has been very well established techniques that can generate defect-free arrays of individually trapped atoms. So the basic procedure is as following. By using some optic device, such as this special light modulator here, we can generate arrays of optic tweezers with any arbitrary geometry. And each optic tweezer is a tightly focused Gaussian beam, and it can hold one and only one atom inside. So with this, you can assemble individual atoms together to get a array of atoms with any configuration. And this configuration can be chosen depends on the problems of interest. And today, if you, for example, Google atom arrays online, you can find many beautiful and interesting figures. Like people can even make Eiffel Tower in a, you know, a 3D uh, optic tracer arrays. And to have this Eiffel Tower, this of course is done by a French group. So it's Antoine Brouwer's group near Paris. And you can even make funny cartoon movies by using these arrays of individually trapped atoms. Like this Super Mario movie is met by Misha Lukin's group at Harvard. So all of these are at turning, right? But to make things more fun, you need to have interactions between atoms. And notice that this uh, distance between atoms is typically larger than one micrometer. So now the question is, how we can have strong interactions between these atoms if the distance between them is like larger than one micrometer. So the one of the approaches that we can have strong interactions between these atoms to make the physics you know, beyond the single particle physics is to use the so-called Rydberg atoms. Rydberg atoms are highly excited atoms. So the valence electron of that atom goes to an energy level with very high principal quantum number n. So it's really excited. So this valence electron now will have a very large orbit radius and is very far away from the atomic nucleus. To give you a comparison, for ground state atom, the orbit radius of the valence electron is typically at the order of 0.5 nanometer. But if you go to a Rydberg state with the principal quantum number you know, around maybe 80, 90, the orbit radius can reach 0.5 micrometer length scale. So you can see there is a factor of thousand difference regarding how far away this electron is. And now because this wireless electron is so far away from the atomic nucleus, Rydberg atoms can have really large electric dipole moment. And we know the interactions between atoms can be induced by their dipole-dipole interaction. For example, between two identical atoms, their interactions are one to one interaction. For ground state atoms, one to one interaction string is so weak and it's completely negligible if two atoms are micrometer away from each other. But the one to one coefficient, C6, scales as n to 11, n is the principal quantum number. So you can already tell if n go to like say 100, this factor is huge. So that's how we can achieve strong dipole-dipole interactions by exciting atoms towards their Rydberg states. So now combining such strong dipole-dipole interactions with this arrays of atoms, we do realize a programmable quantum processor. 
There are two major ways to use this uh, arrays of atoms as control processor. One is analog, one is digital. So quick summary about how to use this as analog control uh, curve simulator is like in this scenario, what we used as our computation results is a many-body homotonial realized by the arrays of atoms. For example, one can choose to encode the spin, like spin down with ground state of that atom, and spin up with a Rydberg state. So in this case, you realize a quantum spin model, which is a many-body homotonial, and you can use this to do some quantum simulation. The advantage of this approach is it is relatively easier to scale the system size up. But the downside is also kind of obvious. As you can already tell, this is not a general purpose quantum computer because you are restricted by what type of homotonials you can realize. On the other side, for the digital approach, the computation is done by implementing a series of quantum gate operations like the following. And in this approach, people normally encode qubits or spins with two different ground states of that atoms because they are long-lived atomic state. And the Rydberg state is only used as an intermediate state to facilitate some multi-qubit gate operations. This approach, in principle, is a general purpose quantum computer. But the challenge at this moment is this approach is quite demanding on uh, how well you can control your system. So this is my short tutorial kind of like how to use arrays of individually trapped atoms as a programmable control processor. And the past few years have witnessed a rapid progress on using it for studying interesting physics and explore new applications. So examples include for quantum simulation, we can start a quantum phase transitions. Like antiferromagnetic phase has been observed in 1D and 2D system. And the quantum spin liquid has also been uh, observed recently. And towards the direction of general purpose quantum computation, high fidelity two qubit gate operations have been demonstrated in multiple groups and entanglement transport has also been realized. So here with this technique, you can actually move atoms around in order to generate long-ranged multi-qubit entanglement. In addition, by combining some optimization algorithms, these arrays of atoms can be used to do quantum optimization. So here, we can actually use this platform to solve some classically hard optimization problems, such as finding a maximum independent set on a graph. So in short, you know this, as a programmable quantum processor, arrays of individually trapped atoms have demonstrated its great scalability. The record of qubit number is about 320 now, and also has great controllability over the positions of atoms. So that's really nice. However, you know, just like any classical computer, having a processing unit itself is not enough. You also need to have the input and output device. So what I mean here, well, to be more specific, we need to do state, quantum state initialization at the beginning and also to detect the state at the end in order to know our results, right? So for neutral atom-based platforms, one thing kind of special is we actually need to construct this quantum computer at the beginning of each experimental cycle, which means we need to use lasers to cool down these atoms from the background gas, trap them, and load them into optic lattice, uh, optic tweezers, sorry. And this uh, stage typically takes maybe 50 to 100 millisecond time scale. After we're loading these atoms into optic tweezers, some extra work is actually needed. This is because loading one and only one atom into an optic tweezer is a stochastic process. As you can tell here, some optic tweezers are actually initially empty. That is to say, 
in order to achieve the target defect-free configuration, you need to drag the atoms maybe outside the region of interest into the region of interest in order to form this target configuration. And as you can tell, for two-dimensional atom array, how to rearrange these atoms efficiently is actually not a trivial task. This rearrangement also typically takes about 50 milliseconds. After we get this desired configuration, we can use these arrays of atoms for doing some quantum processing. This can be done fairly fast. The gate is actually maybe less than 0.1 microsecond, and the total time maybe around 10 to 100 microsecond, depends on what you want to do. So this is a fast processing. So now it comes to the readout stage. So here, our goal is to detect the state of atoms. And the most widely used technique is based on single atom fluorescence image. The basic uh, procedure is as following. Let's say we want to know which atom is pinned down, which atom is pinned up. What we will do is we actually will first repair one type of atoms outside the optic tracer. Let's say we kick out the atoms as their spin up state. So these optic tracers become empty afterwards. Next, we can send some near resonant image light towards the remaining atoms and use a camera to collect the scattered photons. Now we know if we have a bright spot on a camera, the atom is in their spin down state. And if we have dark spot on the camera, then it must be in the spin up state. So that's how we read out the state of atoms. This image stage is kind of slow. That is because the absorption cross section of a single atom is kind of tiny. So in order to collect enough number of photons to have good signal to noise ratio, we need to wait some time. So the detection usually takes a few milliseconds at least. And another big downside of this method, it is destructive. As you can already tell, one type of atoms are forever gone. Which means if we want to do a second next run on this control processor, we have to restart the experiment sequence from this very beginning construction stage. And now you can tell, okay, the time we're actually spending on the control part is even less than 0.01% of the total time of our experiment sequence, which is super inefficient. And in addition to that, because you have atom loss, it kind of forbids you to do quantum error correction if you look you know, from long term. So that's the obvious two bottleneck of this uh, current situation, like the initialization and the readout, namely our speed. So we want to improve these two stages. So the motivation to improve these two stages motivates us to propose another different way to do things in which we are using arrays of atomic ensembles for quantum simulation and computation. So here with very similar or basically the same technique, we can still generate arrays of optic tracers with arbitrary configuration. But now the difference is, instead of having one and only one atom in each optic tracer, we have a small atomic cloud in each tracer. And as you can see from this cartoon, uh, each tracer contains a few hundred atoms inside. And now for the encoding, we choose to encode our spins with different types of Rydberg states. So here, uh, the blue and the red are different types of Rydberg states. They have different angular momentum and the principal quantum number, and we can label them as spin up and spin down, as this shows. So what are the advantages of using arrays of atomic ensembles? Well, first of all, you actually have a fast generation of arrays. There is no need to do rearrangement. If catching one and only one atom into optic tracer is like using chopsticks to catch one ball, which has a high failure rate, our approach is like using a spoon just to grab a few hundred. And we even don't care the exact number of atoms we have in each optic tracer, so there's no need to do rearrangement. And the second and the third advantage are we can have 
fast state initialization and a fast state readout. These two advantages we first demonstrated with a single atomic ensemble experimentally, which I will share in the following slide. So here is how we do the state initialization. We first load a few hundred ground state atoms into an optical tracer. And now our goal here is to initialize this atomic ensemble towards this spin-up state, which has a blue type Rydberg state inside. So this can be done by sending some night beams towards atomic cloud, with the frequencies of these night beams match the energy separation between this ground state and this up state. So we can populate a Rydberg extension inside. Now some of you may start to worry what if you got more than one Rydberg extensions in the cloud, what if you have something like this, which is even not in our defined computation basis, right? Well, the reason we can avoid this from happening is because we choose to work with a very small atomic cloud. So the radius of this atomic cloud is about three micrometer, and because they are small, the strong Rydberg Rydberg interaction forbids us to get more than one extension inside due to this energy palleting. So this is known as the Rydberg blockade effect. And because of that, we can guarantee we have one and only one Rydberg extension per atomic cloud. And the preparation time is about three microseconds, and the fidelity is 93 for this, this work. That's how we do state initialization. Next question to ask is how we detect different Rydberg state. So the goal here is we want to distinguish these two keys. The invented detection scheme is based on a phenomenon known as electromagnetically induced transparency. So what we do is as following. We're sending two coherent light beams towards the atomic cloud, and these two coherent light beams couple the ground state of atoms towards this uh, spin down Rydberg state through this intermediate state. Now, if both light are on resonant with the corresponding transition, the whole atomic cloud is actually transparent towards this detection beam. So that's why it's known as you know, electromagnetically induced transparency, the EIT effect. So it's transparent. However, now if you already have a spin up state, Rydberg state inside the cloud, then the strong interaction between up and down will induce some energy shift. So it will push this state up, for example. Now you can tell the EIT condition is no longer satisfied. And because this EIT condition is no longer satisfied, the whole atomic cloud become opaque towards this detection beam. So now you can see by monitoring the transmission rate of this uh, detection beam, we can know what a type of Rydberg extension we have inside the cloud. And you can see these few hundred ground state atoms here amplify our optical signal, which speeds up our detection speed. So here is a histogram plus the detected photon number on this uh, detector for these two case. So this case is opaque, this case is transparent. As you can see, we can very well distinguish these two cases. So the fidelity of detection for this is 92%. The detection time, six microseconds, is almost the factor of thousand faster compared to this conventional single atom fluorescence image technique. So that's a great news for us. And we also do some analysis, try to understand where the infidelity comes from. And here is our analysis. This plot uh, shows the transmission rate of the detection beam as a function of the detection time. For the case that you have a blue type Rydberg in and without any Rydberg in. So in an ideal world, both curve should be flat because there's no reason like the transmission changes, right? But in reality, they do change with the detection time, especially for the case where you have a Rydberg inside. The slope has an optic, I mean, 
obvious positive slope. And we know this is because uh, we started to lose this Rydberg um, atom inside the cloud during detection. The loss is due to actually the detection light. So the light induced some Rydberg state loss. And the loss rate is about 0.035 per microsecond, which contributes to this you know, unwanted lobe on this histogram plot. And this actually hurts our uh, detection fidelity because we cannot have longer enough detection time. And the above slope slightly decreased. This is because during detection, there is some finite probability we create a Rydberg impurity inside. So that's why this uh, slope slightly decreases. And the creation rate of Rydberg impurity is about 0.015 microsecond. So that's the two major contribution to the infidelity. So yeah, that's our understanding on where the infidelities come from. Last but not least, we also want to do some qubit operation. <coughs> so here, the energy separation between the spin up and the spin down state uh, is at like a few gigahertz uh, frequency, the energy difference. So these are actually nice frequency to work with because there are so many electronic devices available. And this plot shows the rabbi oscillation. So what we plot is the spin up population as a function of the external microwave driving time. And you see this nice rabbi oscillations many, many times. And uh, the time we need to flip the spin from up to down is about uh, 90 nanoseconds. And the coherence time measured through Ram Ramsey measurement is about 15 microseconds. So as you can see, the ratio between these two is not bad, which means we can do many operations before this qubit decoheres into a classic bit. So that's what we demonstrated. So with this, we have demonstrated that we can improve the state initialization and readout speed quite a lot. And this paper was published two years ago on PRL. So encouraged by this result, we did a, actually a major apparatus upgrade afterwards in the hope to generate this uh, array of atomic ensembles. Here are just some figures for fun, like what we do for our vacuum system. And that is what the apparatus looks like afterwards, quite complicated, multi-layer, because we want to mount a lot of like, optic device. But in any case, that's the key optic um, components after this major upgrade. We can now use a spectral light modulator combined with a high numeric aperture objective lens to generate large arrays of optic tracers and trap atomic ensemble inside. And in addition to this kind of hardware upgrade, we also started to use some machine learning based optimization algorithms after you know, this upgrade. Uh, we are using this uh, an open source Python package called mloop to optimize our experiment loading and cooling. So with this, we actually improve the atom number we can load into optic tracers by a factor of three compared to human-based optimization. And I will say another bonus of this, you know, in addition, you have a factor of three improvement, is this thing can actually be automatically done which means you can sleep at home and <laughs> you just let your machine optimize itself over light and next morning you get a happy machine. So that's really attractive, I guess, especially for students. And another unexpected gift actually given by this machine learning based optimization is we actually observed a formation of both Einstein condensate in the optic tracers with simple molasses cooling. And the formation of a BEC with simple molasses cooling for alkali atoms has actually never been seen before experimentally. And we somehow you know, just um, kind of automatically get that. So we are writing a small paper on this surprise gift, but I won't go into any details because it's kind of off the topic. But if you are interested in this, we can chat afterwards. Okay, let's go back to our main story the arrays of atomic ensembles. So with this, we can generate arrays of atomic ensembles with any arbitrary configurations. And now you can see here, uh, each bright spot is a small atomic cloud 
has 200 atoms inside, and the radius of this atomic cloud is about 1.5 micrometer. I also want to emphasize all these images are taken directly after loading atoms into these optic tracer arrays. So there's no rearrangement involved at all. So that's what we got. That's the arrays of atomic ensembles. And now for the detection, what we will do is we will send a global detection beam towards the arrays of atoms and use a camera to do parallel readout. And this is a very, very preliminary result I got just maybe two weeks before I left MIT. So what we do here is as following for the blue histogram correspond to the case without Rydberg qubit inside the atomic cloud and the original one has a readable qubit inside. And as you can see, there's some difference regarding how many photons you can collect it on the camera if you have Rydberg or if you don't have Rydberg. But the distinguishability is not as good as it was. I guess it's better now, but yeah, that's what I got just before I left MIT. Yeah, so that's a prelim demonstration that we can do parallel fast readout of the Rydberg qubit. Okay, so, so that's kind of a quick summary of the second part of my talk. We significantly improve this you know, state initialization stage and also the detection stage. I also want to mention, in addition you know, to simply speeding up the detection, another bonus we get is our detection is not demolished. So atomic cloud is still there after detection which means if we want to start a next run on this quantum processor, we can directly start from here instead of from this stage. So we can have much higher experimental repetition rate compared to previous approaches. So yeah, that's what we got. And next, I guess we need to figure out how to improve the preparation and the detection fidelity because now we are going towards a large scale system we also want to mitigate the crosstalk between qubits in different atomic ensembles. And I think uh, this platform is very suitable for doing quantum simulation on quantum spin models. So I think this concludes the second part of my talk and I will maybe pause here if there is any questions. You could, you mean across ensembles, right? Uh, yeah, so your, your individual uh, tweezers, mm -hmm. each of them is a two level system. Yeah. So space, right. Can you make those yes, we could. Interact yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that definitely happens. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, how do you uh, initialize uh, the different sites individually? Oh, you mean the size of the atoms? That's basically determined by the temperature of the atoms and also the trapping frequencies. So that determines the size of the atom cloud. I mean, um, you have this array and then you have the lasers on the side. Yeah, yeah. The Rydberg lasers. Oh, yeah. Uh, how, in this one, it's just a two big sites, two different sites. Uh, uh, yes, it's a global oh, beam. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question, how you have individual controllability. That's actually even a general question that you can ask any people who work with arrays of uh, you know, individually trapped atoms, which I will try to explain what is my plan to resolve this individual addressability difficulty in my proposed architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Traditional, more traditional single atom yeah. approach. Yeah. I have this enormous asymmetry right, between yeah. this non interactive non state yeah. and the strongly interactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So now, when you, like here, you form the qubit from two Rydberg states, mm -hmm. which are not so different, mm -hmm. basically, right? So the state dependent yeah. interaction. Uh, like so, like so we choose to initialize them actually to the P uh, state Rydberg. P, P are not that strongly interact if they are like a few micrometers away. So you can kind of think they are non-interacting to some extent if they are that far away. 
but the uh, self blockage, if they're like within one micrometer, is still there. But uh, yeah. So it's like hyper. Yeah, 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 right, right. So I think by encoding them with readable states, one advantage you do have, you, you have more degree of freedoms regarding how you want them interact. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Uh, that depends on what is the wobbles. <laughs> yeah, so because you basically, as you can already tell here, these arrays are generated by, let's say, this objective lens, right? So it's basically diffraction limited. So it's diffraction limited by, you can naively think, uh, it's like determined by this wavelength divided by the numeric aperture of this lens. Let's say this is typically, let's say 0.5, and your tracking wavelength is typically, let's say 0.8 micrometer. So the separation between these tracers is then like 1.5 micrometer. So yeah, that's a typical like lens care that you can have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's I guess we also discussed that. So that's why I think maybe ethereum is better because you can start with some initially high state, which the last excited states are more closer in energy, so they have longer wavelengths in transition. That might be easier to fulfill your several wavelengths requirement. What were the rubidium and the in this is just the rubidium, so it's typical the, the first transition is seven hundred and eighty nanometer. Yeah. Nothing too special about this atomic species. Oh but no, between readable is like a gigahertz, so it's a centimeter. Oh, that's the that's the relevant Yeah, yeah, right. Yes, right. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh yes, so we actually don't want to be easy. So the funny thing is like 20 years ago, people tried so hard to get busy, and for us we even don't want to be easy because the density is too high. So we avoid to have busy in the tweezers. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we, yeah, so that's why we are kind of careful about what is the beam width of the optical tracers. If they are too tight, it's not good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. If no further question, I will move on to what I plan to do for my own group. Yeah, okay. So, yes, so let's take us, let's, let us take a look at the wish list for quantum computing, right? So I think these items will be there. So I will say architecture based on neutral atoms trapped in optical tracers can get a great score regarding scalability and also coherence time. If we consider the gate fidelity at this moment, maybe the highest one is like maybe 98.5% gate fidelity, which is not as high as like ion-based platforms, for example, but we are catching up. But I do think there is a lot of space to be improved uh, regarding the programmability. So what I mean by programmability is we actually need to figure out how to fulfill uh, what I listed here regarding like local qubit operations on a subset of atoms, which like you bring it up, and also how to do non-demolish and selective qubit detection, and also reuse qubit for high experimental replication rate so that's what we need. And I think with all of this, we may be able to develop a path towards implementing quantum error correction. So for me, my goal for my own group is I want to develop new schemes that can fulfill these needs here and use my platform to start a new physics and also new applications. To reach these goals, what I plan to do is to build up, uh, I call it a hybrid quantum system. So what I mean here is I plan to combine array of individual atoms and array of atomic ensembles. 
And here is a schematic diagram showing what I propose to do. As you can see here, there are two types of arrays. The bottom one is met with arrays of individually trapped atoms, and I plan to encode my spin of qubits with this bottom layer. And the top layer is an array of atomic ensembles, and I have some ideas about how to use these atomic ensembles to do some ancillary operations on the below individual qubit. And I can have controllable interactions between these two layers, the method that I will discuss maybe in a few minutes. So regarding the choice of the atomic species, for the bottom layer, I plan to use the terbium atoms. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, so I won't bother you with atomic physics you know, too much, but the tag home message is the terbium atom as an air client earth like atoms, it has two valence electrons instead of one. And because it has two valence electrons, it actually has many nice features as listed here which makes it become a very promising blo uh, building block for this atom array-based architecture. And for the atomic cloud, I will simply use rubidium atoms. Rubidium atoms may be the simplest atoms to work with in our cold atom community, so rubidiums are our best friend. The reason to choose different atomic species for this uh, dual-type array is because I want to avoid unwanted crosstalk between these two layers. And also with this, I can actually have more degree of freedoms regarding how well I can control interlayer interactions and intralayer interactions. To have a controllable interlayer interactions, what I plan to do is to use the so-called forced resonance which allows me to tune the interactions between these two layers with external electric field. To see the working principle, let's take a concrete example about a specific choice on the Rydberg state. For example, now I choose to use this, uh, one of the valence electrons of the ytterbium goes to the 62 S state. 62 is the principal, 62 is the principal quantum number as is the angular momentum. And my rubidium has its Rydberg state at 71s. Without external electric field, there is almost no interactions between this uh, ytterbium Rydberg and rubidium Rydberg. But what will happen if I started to apply some external DC electric field? Well, one thing for sure is we know the total energy of this pair of Rydberg states will change as a function of external electric field which is the stark effect. So it changes, as this plot shows, the blue curve is the total energy of this ytterbium and rubidium, and it kind of goes down as you are turning on the external electric field. But since we become more fun, if you also plot the energy of some nearby Rydberg pairs. For example, now the closest one regarding energy is the ytterbium 62p and rubidium 70p. So as shown by this origin curve. And as you can see, at some finite electric field, the blue and origin cross each other, right? The energy state become degenerate here. But because there are dipole-dipole interactions between this, this choice and this blue origin choice and this blue choice, it will actually open a gap here to have anti-crossing. And this induce interactions between uh, ytterbium and rubidium. So that's the forced resonance. And what this plot shows is the interaction between these two Rydberg states when they are about five micrometer away from each other. And the interaction strings near the crossing uh, spot is actually comparable to the Rydberg Rydberg interactions between two identical rubidium atoms. But the advantage we have now such interactions can be rapidly switched on and off by simply changing the external electric field. So it's really flexible regarding how you want them to interact or not. So that's my uh, plan to have controllable interactions between these two layers. And I believe because now I have controllable interactions between these two layers, I can do many, I can develop many new schemes to fulfill what I listed here. Let's start with this uh, selective non-demolished detection first, because the working principle is 
basically the same as what have been demonstrated at MIT. So now what we will do is as following. In order to know what a type of ytterbium atom we have here, we will monitor the optical response of this atomic cloud. So the detection beam actually couples atomic transitions in rubidium atom, uh, atom cloud. And if you encode uh, qubits with ground state of ytterbium atoms, you can excite one of it towards the Rydberg state before you do detection. Now, because you have interactions between this uh, ytterbium Rydberg and rubidium Rydberg, the optical response of the atomic cloud conditioned on what type of ytterbium you have, right? So that's how we achieve like a detection. But one major advantage of this proposed scheme compared to what we have done at MIT is you can now tear the qubits of interest especially separated from your detector. And all the detection beam is actually unresonant with ytterbium only. The ytterbium kind of stay in dark during the detection stage. And because of this, we are actually expecting a much higher fidelity. It's maybe about 99% fidelity based on our estimation. And I think selective detection is also possible because all these scattered photons are not unresonant with ytterbium. So it won't decohere other ytterbiums that they are not interested in. So this is how we achieve uh, this selective and long demolish rapid detection. And because of this detection scheme, we kind of naturally can reuse qubit for high repetition rate. And also combine these two, we at least fulfill the minimal requirement for doing quantum error correction. So now the only thing remaining here is how to do reconfigurable local qubit operation on a subset of atoms. So what I mean here can be maybe kind of illustrated by one simple example. So what I want to do here, let's say I have an array. I only want to do some qubit operations on this three, for example, at t equals one, and let us do something else on this three, you know, not a global operation. This, you know, first maybe you think it's quite a simple goal, right? The easiest way you can do this, you can simply send in some like qubit operation beams with their pattern, match the pattern of qubits of interest then these three qubits evolve and the other qubits remain unchanged. Well, although this looks quite simple on a PowerPoint slide, it's quite hard to realize that experimentally. This is because from the experimental side, to generate this arbitrary pattern of optic beams with strict regulation on their power and frequencies, is almost impossible for currently available commercial optic device. So this won't work. That's just a two challenge for available device. So as an alternative solution, what we can do is we can have local light shift by applying some far off resonant individual addressing beam towards this qubit. So this green light are actually couple one of the qubit state to one some other intermediate state far away from resonant. And through acid dark shift, the qubit with individual addressing beam will have actually different energy separation compared to the qubits without this individual addressing beam. But this individual addressing beam is far away from resonance. So you kind of relax your strict regulation on the frequency control that opens some possibility of using current uh, available optic modulators. However, the downside of this approach is, okay, sorry, I forgot to mention. Now you can send some global qubit operation beam towards the arrays and some you know, respond, some don't because they are off resonant. But the downside of this approach is because now you mix some short lived intermediate state into your qubit state, you for sure reduce your qubit lifetime. And you also limit your qubit operation speed because operation speed cannot be fast larger compared to the induced local energy shift. And the high power on this addressing beam is always preferred causing some additional technique complexities. So that's the downside of this approach. 
So to overcome these um, challenges here, what I plan to do is differently. I want to use assemble to assist assemb use our my atomic ensemble to assist some individual qubit control. What I could do here is I can selectively create Friedberg extensions in this atomic cloud, which can be done actually technically not hard. Because for this purpose, I even don't care the generation of Friedberg extension inside the cloud is a coherent process or not. So that's quite easy to do. And now, as you can tell, afterwards, I can use this uh, Rydberg atom inside the cloud to index the below ytterbium atom. So now even with global qubit operation beams, these three qubit will respond differently to most global qubit operation beams. We have many, some different ideas about how to implement one qubit operation and two qubit operation. I guess we need to try to see how well they perform. I just want to quickly mention one I'm kind of excited to try. This is a single qubit operation scheme and it is inspired by this theoretical proposal actually many years ago for different purpose. But we try to use some um, like spirit in mentioning this paper. So what we do here is we were sending three light beams towards the ytterbium atoms which actually fulfill an EIT condition. Without bothering, bothering you with details, the tag home message is, if you keep the control light all, on all the time, and do you ramp on, ramp up and ramp down this omega p, if the EIT condition is satisfied, this qubit will actually not involve, it will stay unchanged. However, if now you have a Rydberg extension in the nearby atomic cloud, let's say you have this case, then the interaction between this rubidium Rydberg and ytterbium Rydberg will destroy the EIT condition. Now, in this case, your system kind of go back to a textbook example of two photon Raman translation, and your qubit will start to rotate with the rotational angle equals to the area below this omega p. So that's how we want that's that's what we want to try for individual qubit control. Okay, so that's we complete this. And we hope, you know, our hope is by combining one single atom and many atomic, many atoms nearby to get the best of both. And with this, we hope we can make this shooting a cat happy. And yeah, so that's what I hope to improve on the technique side. And I do think this dual type binary structure could be a very promising new architecture to explore new physics and also new applications. So for the scientific, okay, I have five minutes. Uh, for the scientific part, what I plan to start initially is to investigate quantum information dynamics. So this topic, you can think it collects actually many different fields from fundamental physics to application, you know, examples including quantum summarization, Long equilibrate dynamics, even quantum gravity, and how to do topological uh, encoding. And because, generally speaking, uh, studying these problems with classical computers is hard because the here border space is simply too big to be simulated efficiently. So there are still many open questions. And experimental platforms, you know, like trapped ion superconduct, superconducting circuits and atom arrays are really good platforms to investigate these unknown open problems. What I am particularly interested in is to use my platforms to study the situation where the unitary quantum evolution is interspersed with some measurement. So what I mean here is like you have a system, you can do some subsystem measurement during the quantum evolution and you study how this subsystem measurement change the evolution afterwards. This topic has recently attracted a lot of interest from theories. For example, on the fundamental physics side, people discovered a universal quantum phase transition, which is induced by this measurement. So this quantum phase, tra phase transition is really sharp. The entanglement entropy changes from a volume law to scale, scaling law. So if you do like a high rate uh, measurement, the entanglement entropy will scale according to a, an area law. 
And on the applied side, people do think, you know, this thing has a deep connection with some threshold theorem for achieving fault-tolerant quantum computation because you can view this measurement as some types of errors. So there must be some connection here. And the hope is by starting this, we may get better understanding on how to dynamically protect our information by doing dynamic encoding. But this topic is really hard. As far as I know, there is no concrete pro proposals on this. It's because you not only encoding itself is not enough, right? You also need to decode things efficiently. So that's hard. But what I do know is by combining measurement and some classical communication, it is possible to implement some measurement-based protocols which can do quantum information processing more efficiently. So that's what I plan to try in my group after I get my apparatus running. And I also want to point out, although there are a lot of interest from theoretical physics, uh, doing this study experimentally is still quite a challenge. Regarding this quantum, quantum phase transition, so far there are only two experimental papers uh, from a trapped ions and also superconducting circuit. There is no experiment done with neutral cold atoms, mostly due to the difficulties of doing long demolish subsystem measurement and also reuse of qubits. Because my platform can mitigate these two challenges, I'm really excited to start this topic. Okay, so this concludes my talk. And uh, okay, so the work has done at MIT and Harvard uh, is like a joint project between uh, Vlad Vujicic from MIT and Misha Lukin from Harvard. And that's previous uh, PhD and wasting master students and that's current PhD students. And for what I discussed today for my ETH group, uh, I have a master student at ETH and he helped me doing some like simulation on the forced resonance and I also have like some PhD and the postdoc students in my group now. And I do have postdoc position open, so if you are interested or you know who may be interested in, just contact me. Yeah, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer more questions.